So we just went over two things. One, how to use this as a fake BiPAP, which is essentially just a VVM, a vent valve mask, with the pressure setting to its most sensitive setting so you don't increase the, uh, the pressure with inside the thorax, break that cardiac sphincter, and start insufflating the stomach with a strap. It's strapped to its head. Now, here's a question we didn't answer in the last video. Can you strap the VVM, the vent valve mask, to a patient's head, like an unconscious narc overdose or an unconscious uh, hypoglycemia that you're trying to bag, but you just put them on the vent? No, don't do that. And here's a good reason why you don't want to do that. You don't want them to aspirate without you being there. So let me give you this nightmare scenario. You got a narc overdose. You're rocking and rolling. You're doing your thing. You got this uh, new whoever, whatever side, fire, EMS, nurse, blah, 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 whatever. You put them on the vent valve mask and you start uh, doing your thing and somebody pushes two milligrams Narcan real quick. That patient aspirates. Is he going to be able to have the cognitive resistance not to take that uh, VVM off? No. He is going to aspirate and that air is going to get pushed. All that vomit's going to get pushed right into his lungs. So that's why we don't strap down a VVM, a vent valve mask, onto an unconscious patient. I need you there holding a seal. And that th there's a reason for that. I want you to hold that seal. Get two hands on each side of that BVM. Lift up that jaw and really start press the mask to the, or uh, press the face up into the mask or the mask down into the face and make sure you get a good proper seal. That's the entire reason I want you there. It's freeing up a hand so you don't have to compress that bag. So you got two hands to hold that seal and you got the vent doing the rest of the work. Now, one other thing we didn't mention in our last one, the fake BiPAP. Would I put that on anybody semi-conscious or unconscious? No, and most of the time they really don't anyway. What I'd want you to do it is this is mainly idea, and I put this idea in your head just to sort of think about things. So you could put it, like say, on an asthmatic, see how it works out like that. But remember, like I said in the last one, follow your medical direction, talk to your medical director, go over some things, understand the machinery very well, and why you would put BiPAP versus CPAP on any patient, why they do it in the hospital. So let's move on. We've, we've already been over this, spent three more minutes on it. The, the fake BiPAP and the VVM. Remember, we can't use it in CPR. Moving on. CPAP. No, okay, we just talked about BiPAP. Now we're on to continuous positive pressure ventilation. And it, why is that different? How is that? And, and notice that, that these actually don't mat match up because it's continuous positive airway pressure. But this is sort of the exact same thing, continuous positive pressure ventilation. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to push in a continuous amount of air, five centimeters of water of air just pressing into you, continuously, continuously going. And if any of you have seen this or put this on a person, it's kind of daunting. They get a little scared. They're not really about it. They, they think that it's becoming harder to breathe, specifically for asthmatics. And that's because it is. They already can't breathe outward due to their bronchoconstriction. And then you add more air onto there, and it kind of makes them a little claustrophobic, and they hate it until it starts to work. Now, what is CPAP trying to do? What is, what is the, the main idea of it? Because it sounds counterintuitive to put it on this asthmatic, asthmatic patient, right? What it's trying to do is forcibly, forcibly stretch open the muscles of your bronchi. So your bronchi are constricted. They're, they're going down. And what they're trying to do is push air into there to forcibly expand it, to make that tube a little bit bigger, make that radius of that tube a little bigger. And this will make a lot of really good sense on why that's so important. If you guys go and watch my uh, video on the Pousset's equation and how it uh, delineates radius versus flow. So what they're really trying to do is just force that airway open inside your bronchioles for asthmatics. But there are a couple other reasons we use it, right? 
we actually use it for pulmonary hemorrhage. And to be honest, I have never used it for pulmonary hemorrhage. And when I think pulmonary hemorrhage, I think of little kids who have gotten hit uh, in the chest who have uh, really soft cartilage, cartilaginic ribs. And that can, you, you know, if they get hit in the chest, they could break alveoli, start bleeding with inside their alveoli. But other than that, not really much because you would never put this on a patient who had, say, a flail chest or who had some broken ribs with inside their, their thorax. Congestive heart failure, that's a big one. CHF leading to pulmonary edema. They have a backflow of fluid with inside their alveoli. Now, what's that doing? That's making that surface area a lot smaller. It's expanding all of that area to where you not now you're not going through two cells and the oxygen's not trying to get through two cells. It's trying to get through two cells and all this water or all this blood, all this backflow of fluid with inside your alveoli. So not only does your uh, alveoli have to go through surfactant, the two cells, and then get to your capillary system, now it has to go through surfactant, all this water backup, your two cells, and then to your capillary bed. And that's, that's too hard. It's hard to breathe. And what you're trying to do is get that fluid out of that system. You're trying to get it out of that system. So what you do is you put them on CPAP. And that when they breathe outwards, they go. And upon that exhalation, they're having to breathe against a positive airway pressure, which forces it to back up airway pressure into the alveoli, pushing that water outward. So it pushes that water outward back into the capillary bed, gets it out of there. So you can have that good diffusion of oxygen. That's what it's all about, diffusion of oxygen. Now, on the atelectasis side of this entire thing, because that's one of the other reasons we give it. I mean, you can think of it giving, most of the time they give it to newborns. And, uh, you know, uh, well, frankly, newborns is the only ones I could really think of that they give it for atelectasis. And some of the major reasons that they give it is compression. So these, uh, the alveoli are actually sticking to each other or you're getting atelectasis. And what will it do? It'll do the exact same thing that it was doing for the pulmonary edema, opening up the, those alveoli, putting more pressure into them. Gas reabsorption. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a little bit of a different one, right? That's, that's one that you're trying to think of. When they give patients on, like, say, 100% FiO2 over a long time, you really never see that in hospital. What they're trying to avoid is gas reabsorption. They're trying to avoid that nitrogen washout or all those molecules of the washout with inside your alveoli because how much oxygen is actually in our air? Well, only 21%. Now, when we give them pure oxygen, it washes all that other uh, uh, percentage away and that 21% goes to 100% and that diffuses very quickly causing atelectasis. Impaired surfactants, what's, when I was talking about they give it to newborns, that's one of the reasons they give it. If you have no surfactant with inside your alveoli, your alveoli collapse, being completely useless. So what they do is they give positive pressure ventilation, forcing them to open up that alveoli and be able to have some sort of diffusion through an airway. I hope that really opens up your mind to what a CPAP is actually used for. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to email me. And remember to look at Pousset's equation that I'm going to have up really soon. What I want you guys to think of, why I put this picture up, is because don't only focus on that ventilator. There's so much more stuff that you need to focus around you. Yeah, put that ventilator on there. Make sure it's tip top. But you need to be the ICU nurse who knows who can look at medications, who can look at the patient's stats, who can look at everything around around him or her and understand what's going on. So you guys need to really be cognizant of everything that's happening around you, not only with the ventilator. All right, guys, I'm going to sign off. This is going to be the fourth part. We're going to go into the fifth part real quick and knock it out. I thank you guys so much for listening, and I will see you all on the next one.